in Galatians. Or we should, or should I go come to that, I guess? I better come to that. I better not start with that. Yeah, I better come to that. But uh, once again, been trying to, to explain in part this word, new creation. Everybody, you know, when we got coming to the church today, one of the things I know we came in with, we, you need to be born again, which necessary, which means that I need a new birth, okay? I have to have a new birth, okay? There's nothing, uh, the old birth was one of death. The new birth is one of life. Now, one of, the hardest part is, in all of this, is that we somehow, somehow we got food in our new birth. We got born again. But then all of a sudden, once we got born again, we wanted to go back and resurrect the old man to try to make him live when there's no life in him. But somehow, in our new birth, we got blindsided. And I think that's what the book of Galatians mostly is about. And, and a lot of times when we read the book of Galatians, a lot of times when it's talking about you, you think it's talking about somebody else because of our concept of what we think the new birth is supposed to be. We think the new birth means that, well, I get to go to church now. But the new birth was not about me getting to go to church. My new birth was about being birthed by God to become a son of God. My new birth gave me a new family tree. My new birth gave me a new nature. Now, no one had to teach you how to live the old nature because you lived it long enough to know. And so you know where you was. So if I tell you again, if I call it, if the Bible calls it new, it means it's going to be something that's not like it used to be. A new birth is not the same as the old birth. Okay, so he's, he can't fix what he didn't fix. He made new. But the problem is, is that, again, the, 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 the parable or the words of Jesus was that new wine would never be satisfied when you're trying to put it into an old wineskin. New wine would never work because the more you get new wine, because, you know, you know, faith is so scary and yet it's so rewarding, but it's very scary. I don't like walking in places I've never been. I'm very reluctant to step in a, a place where I have never been. It's not easy for me to make that transition, especially when what I think what I've done has been so right. <laughs> you know, it's going to be hard for you to convince me that it's not right. But the problem is, is that when Jesus gave you the Holy Ghost, he gave you a new life, not just trying to fix your old man so you can live with it. Matter of fact, the Bible said if you really got a new birth, you will consider the old man a dead man, uh, consider yourself dead so you, that you might live. So we're going to go through a little bit more of this. And I probably will stop after a while, but right now I can't get out this vein. I mean, every week, it's like uh, I keep, it's like God shows a little bit more light on this because understanding what he is saying and what he is doing, what he has done in you, makes a whole lot different how you're going to perceive what's going to happen in your life later. Most of the time, it's that we get saved, but we don't really know what salvation really entails. We just... You know, most, we, we spent most of our time in Pentecost preaching people to hell. We knew more about hell. I got one guy right now that really grieves my spirit. He wants you to know more about the devil than know about God. See, I, I can tell you all about the devil, and you can amen me to death about the devil, but nothing's going to change because you know what the devil does. 
Not one thing. I can tell you everything about devils. But does that change you? No. You know why it doesn't change you? Because first of all, you got to understand the Bible says the devil is a deceiver. So if he's a deceiver, why do you want to learn deception? Jesus Christ is the truth. If I know the truth, I can't be deceived. But if all I'm studying is deception, remember, everything he tells you about deception, he's deceiving you again. Because the more he can deceive you into believing his lie versus the truth of God is that now you're so busy, concerned, man, what the devil is doing. I have a real problem today about us preaching more about the devil, the hell, and all these other things that goes with it. Because the real key to this is not, if you, even if you didn't grasp that, if you don't grab Jesus, you still ain't got life. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you still are just as dead, knowing dead stuff, you have not got life. Because life can only come through one way. It's through Christ. So, I think we have, you know, it is... Uh, a Jordan River to cross. It's a veil to be rented. It is everything but you. It has everything to do with him. We don't have, we don't have a problem uh, saying that it's all about him, but really when it all comes down to it, we live like it's all about us. Right? Because all we're concerned about is us, self-preservation. How do I preserve myself? And God is saying, if you seek to save yourself, if you seek to save yourself, <laughs> guess what's going to happen? You're going to be lost. But if I will give myself up and lose myself, forget about me, then I'm going to find life. Because what we have done is that we still want to pursue, we really, it's like Abraham Sarah and Hagar. Abraham loved Ishmael because Ishmael was his first birth, his first born. Amen. And he said he pleaded with God. He pleaded with him. When God told him, the boy's got to go. He pleaded with God, said, oh, Lord, can he not walk before you? Can he not, can I not keep Ishmael and Isaac too? But God said, no. You know what God is saying the same thing to us today? Amen. <laughs> we, don't, we don't see that though. We still want to make this first bird beautiful. We'll still spend a lot of time, spend a lot of money on expensive cologne trying to make it smell good. <laughs> We're still trying to find the finest threads to dress it up in so that we can parade it before God and God will say, yes, you know what, I'm going to take that Ishmael. I want Ishmael. But he said, no. Because Ishmael is not going to promote your happiness. The happiness you're looking for can only be found in one place, in Isaac. Isaac was born happy. He was born with a name that means happy. And so here we get saved. There's, I have never seen more sad Christians in my life. I've never seen more Christian with more problems in my life. Matter of fact, as a Christian, we seem to have more problems than the world does. Now, why is that? Could it be that we're like Israel? We came out of Egypt, but Egypt never came out of us. Because the moment they get delivered, the first thing they want to do is go back and think about what they've done in Egypt. They, they was walking with God and constantly manna wasn't good enough. They kept walking with God and every time they came to a hard place, they was the first one to complain. They didn't look to God. They complained about the situation. Whereas if God is leading, he already knows the situation. He knew it before you got there and when God leads you to a problem, that means you're not going to solve it. Guess who's going to solve that? Hello, somebody. 
Yeah. If he's leading and I come to a storm, you know what we do? We curse the storm instead of trying to see God. And we're sitting here asking God to get us out of something that really he needs to bring us to. We are rather for God to go ahead and do one of them powerful miracles for us that we don't have to suffer anything, going through anything. We don't want any inconvenience. God, get me out of this. Lord, you, we, oh God, I can't, I can't stand it. Let me tell you something. If God is your strength, if God is your strength, there is nothing. His weakness is stronger than my strength. If I even think God is weak, he's still stronger than all my strength put together. But what we do, it's easy for us to say those things. It's easy. I get Facebook messages all the time. You know, God will uh, God, uh, God, uh, see you through. If you believe it, type amen. It's if I type amen to make it real. I'm not, you know, you ain't got to send me none of that. I know that's right. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of rhetoric. That's a lot of talk. I know. If I believe that, I ain't got to say it. I just live that. And you know what we're talking is not what we're believing. It's what we want to believe but still not believing because if I really believe that, then you know what? I'm going to start living that every day. Amen. You know, when there ain't but two biscuits in the house, guess what? I'm going to lift my hands and thank God. You know why? Because I live what I believe. I believe God can multiply. You know you know how we read those scriptures, man, how he filled the meal barrels and all and Kept the, kept the flow going. And, you know, we believe that until it's our turn to keep, get the flow going. You know, all of a sudden, you know, I know, I know what God done. You know, I know he did it for them. I know he did it for a lot of things. A lot of things he did in that Bible. But now when it comes to me and those situations in my life, that's a different story. Now I have really wondering and part of the reason why we wonder, because we have not visualized or understood, first of all, our self-worth in God. And because we haven't visualized our self-worth in God, we're constantly trying to make ourselves worthy enough to receive what he said you was worth. See, I, God shows you in his word what you're worth by what he was willing to pay for you. You know, I, I, I never was in slavery, but I have learned about some things in slavery. You know, you, you were worth so much if you were so big and, and got good teeth and all that, you was worth a lot more. See, I got false teeth now, so I wouldn't be worth too much. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> Everybody have this, I mean, we have this scale, even in, 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 in today. We have a, 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 an invisible scale in which we place worth on people. You know, you see somebody out there on the side of the road panhandling, what do you think? How much is he worth? Well, I'll tell you what, he ain't worth me stopping. <laughs> but Jesus would stop. See, there's a lot of things we see them as a lesser system because they're not productive in our economy. All right. But see, God sees them as worth so much more because he sees them worth his blood. But unless I'm looking through God's eyes, I don't see real worth in everybody I meet. I'm going to look at them and there's some people, they rate different on my scales. I'm going to be honest. I'm getting through that because I realize one thing. Every soul that's sucking oxygen is worth so much to God. When we feel it, when we begin to see the worth of God in people, then we're going to treat them like God would treat them because God thought they was worth enough to die for. See, we thought God only died for us when we came to church. Right? Tell the truth. Yeah, we, we didn't see no worth in ourselves until we came to church. But we was worth the same amount before you got to church. Huh? 
But we, we felt like, and even now, so I come to church, so when I see people that's not in church, I don't think they're worth as much as me. Just give us a Baptist nod. It's good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> notice our ideas. Notice, notice when you see somebody that don't go to church, all we have is a negative attitude towards them. We have a negative view of them. Man, they better get their life right. They better do this. But you never said that to yourself when you was doing it. Did you? No. Matter of fact, I couldn't even, I couldn't even come to tell you. <laughs> you just mind your own business. <laughs> I'm grown. I do what I want to do. Right? Is that not what we say? But all of a sudden, God saves us. We come to church, and all of a sudden, you know, once we come to church, everybody else is going to hell now. What would have happened then? Think about this. What would have happened if, if, if your life would have been cut short? Would you want to go into eternity without Jesus? Hmm? I, 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 you know, there's a lot of things in this world you can lose. And there's nothing in this world that you have gained that you're going to take. Nothing. Not one thing. The only thing I see in this world that's worth anything is what's going to keep me in this world and keep me when I'm out of this world. If that's not important to you, then you're really missing the whole point of living. Because what you do, it don't matter what I'm president of the United States of America. I can gain all the notoriety of Hollywood and get all kind of Grammys and Emmys. But if I leave this world and I have not connected and I don't know who he is, never made the connection to him, then it had been better I had never been born. I've wasted oxygen and resources. I've wasted everything I've had. So it's very important that we understand. When we talk about the new covenant, you really need to understand the new covenant because the new covenant is not about you one day waking up in heaven. The new covenant is when heaven starts in you right now. We are in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Somebody said, well, I can't wait till I die. No, you better learn how to live first. You was already dead. Yeah, you were dead while you yet was in sin. You were dead. You thought you was alive, but you were dead. So now I need, I need to make sure I'm not putting my life on hold, the real life. And many put it on hold because they begin to talk about, well, you know, man, I can't wait till I get away. He's going to wipe away all my tears. Why can't he wipe them away now? I can't wait, boy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout all around and stuff. Why can't you do that now? I can't wait till I get over heaven, boy. Woo! This is going to be joy, joy, joy. How come that ain't now? Hello? If you think heaven is all about joy, then you ought to be enjoying joy now, yes. right? Because everything that he is, is now. Right. He says, as I am, so are, where? In this present world. So what are you waiting on? Why are you waiting so long to be happy? Waiting so long to get joy? Yes, ma'am. No, just, just, just. But if a person, do you believe a person can just go through so much? Not that they don't have joy. Can trials and tribulation make you kind of like, I don't know where I'm trying to find. All in what you're looking at. I guess, but I'm, I guess I'm at, can trials and tribulations sometimes can kind of like put a mild damper on some things of, I, you know, in your walk. I mean, no, you know, no, here, here, here's what put a damper on. Okay, no, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. You, 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 you're saying what many would say. First of all, anything that's against you or works against you can drain you if that's where your attention is. Not so much of the attention. I mean, I guess, okay, you're saying attention, but you can't ignore it if it is, how can I say this, in your circle. And when I mean circle with family, uh, with spouses, children, 
grandchildren. Mm-hmm. And what I'm saying, in your circle. Now, if all of this is in your circle and you just keep just sitting there, things are just pulling, it's raining, it's pulling, mm-hmm. and it's raining. I mean, but doesn't that sometimes, it's not that you don't have the joy, but it's like a pool in the drain after you just keep going through and going through and seem like when God fixed this, something else go wrong. When God fixed this, here come another phone call. There's another knock at the door. There's the police at the door. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just throwing up. I'm not saying yeah. anything. Yeah, I, I, I'm just saying, yeah. can't you become drained from going through so many trials and tribulations, though? If your vision is on your trial, yes, you will be drained. But tell me, how do you ignore I'm He whose mind stay, he, he will like keep you, you no, no, see, that's what I'm saying. We can have all the scriptures, but the scriptures don't do us no good if, it, if the scriptures don't have us. Maybe I'm not saying it correctly. You know, you no, I understand what you're saying. But, but here, what I'm trying to tell you, here's Paul. Paul tells you this. Now, here's what happens when you finally begin to see beyond your tribulations. Paul had them. Paul was drained. Paul prayed three times. He said, Lord, remove this from me. He said, I sought God three times. Because do you think he liked that? No, no. But there is a revelation that comes from tribulation. God is revealed. You wouldn't know how powerful God is without him. So what happened, Paul said, Especially when, you know, you're speaking in tongues. You got the Holy Ghost. Paul casting out devils, raising dead folks. And he comes up against, see, there's problems that you can't solve. God intended for it to be just like that. You're not going to solve it. Because God ain't trying to change your problems. He's trying to change you. God solves a problem before you ever got there. But he uses those problems to bring you into revelation. Paul finally came to say, you know what? I finally realized some things. In my weakness, there's strength. Uh, Now he said, I'd rather glory. Now in my infirmities, that the strength of God can be made perfect. There's nothing like finally relinquishing your right on yourself and finally realizing that if God can't do it, it cannot be done. Okay, does it drain us? Yes. Man, I'm going to tell you what, I, 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 could, I could tell you some things today, but I don't want to, I'm not trying to confess my problems or anything like that. I'm not trying to go through all that. Everybody's got some type of stuff you got to go through. And it does not always work like you want it to, but you got to realize one thing. God's attention is not really on your problems as much as it is it's on him changing you, even though he may not change your problems. Well, here, 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 here's the thing. is that the Holy Ghost in me is a change. His nature is in me. Right. Okay. What you're putting up with, what you think you're putting up with, God been putting up with since man been here. Okay. And he ain't having a nervous breakdown over it. No, I'm just saying, though. Okay. He ain't lost no joy of it either. None. Okay, so now, when I started seeing him, I'm seeing him, what he has done about my situation. He, he don't always change your situation. He will change you, though. And that's what he's really here to do, not to change your situation as much as to change you in the situation so that you can see it like he sees it. You may be the only bridge, the only link to the very one you're trying to ask out of your life. You might be the only person in this world God placed you in that place for that very reason. It could be you could have King Saul in your life. You may be a David. But David realized one thing. I can change this. I can touch it and change it, but I'd be wrong. Because you know why? God wasn't trying to change King Saul. He was only trying to change King David. He said, and now I see David is a man. That's my own heart. God won't say the same thing about you. She's a woman. That's my own heart. Why? 
Saul done chased you with spears. When you do good, Saul put you down. Saul used you when he needed you, but he, when he didn't need you, he was trying to kill you. Now, you can allow that to get in your crawl space. You can almost allow yourself to start feeling sorry for yourself because you've been used like that. But then Jesus come on saying, they didn't do it unto you. They ain't doing it to you. Once you get that revelation, they ain't doing it to you. They're doing it as unto him. When they touch me, they're not really touching me. They got to touch him. That's why Paul, when Jesus came and knocked him down on Damascus Road, he said, Paul, why persecutest thou me? When was Paul persecuting Jesus? When was killing his people? Because when you touch the people of God, you are touching God himself. His investment is in the people. That's why we get crazy. Christian people get crazy. We'll, we'll attack each other think we're, we're doing something great for God. You ain't doing nothing great for God because you attack another Christian. All, all, you, all you've done is touch Jesus. And, and you know what? You really, I can't even pray against you. There's not one prayer that I ever pray against you that God would answer. Not one. Who art thou, O man, that would judge another man's servant? Because his account is not given to you or I, but given unto him who has called you. I am accountable unto God for everything God has placed in my life. I am accountable unto God. I, you're not accountable to me. You are accountable unto God. At the end of the day, you, you're not going to be able to say, well, I'd have been saved if it wasn't for Brother Wilson. No, no. I ain't your Savior. <laughs> okay? I ain't even trying to be your Savior. I don't even, I don't even desire to be your Savior. You know why? Because I'm in need of one too. Okay, so I need to get this revelation of my Savior like you need to have a revelation of your Savior because we look to people to do what God can do, and people can't do what he does. Oh, hallelujah. Let's turn to Romans. I think we was there. We were there, I don't know. We were there Thursday night? Slightly. Well, okay, I'm going to come on back to it in just a minute. But let me just, again, in Romans chapter 8, See, most people, when you hear the word free, you don't understand the word free because you, de you design your freedom based upon the Constitution of the United States of America. And your whole concept of freedom is based upon some type of law that keeps, that causes you to be free, you think, okay? So we need to understand that, is that, see, freedom, real freedom, is real freedom. Like in America today, I have, you know, they say, we're free, but you're really only free to do what they tell you to do, all right? Your freedom does not exceed what they consider freedom is. Just like if you decide to sit down, you know, they got this football guy, Kaepernick. He didn't, he didn't stand up at, a, at the ball game. Now, now, if he's free, he should be free to sit down or stand up. Right. He's not free. He's got, he got in trouble. I don't watch games. So I don't yeah, he's in trouble. He, he, he ain't got no job. <laughs> well, no, but I'm just saying, I, I'm, not, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying what he's doing right or wrong, but I do believe if you're going to promote freedom, you know, the man that died, say he died for the flag, well, when you died for that flag, you died for those others to be free not to as well as those to do. Otherwise, you wasn't free, all right? But that's a whole nother story. I'm not political. I'm not trying to get in that arena. 
I just, I'm just seeing the double standards of what we call freedom. If it's free, he's free. I, you know, does it bother me he don't stand up? No, it don't bother me. If I feel like I need to stand, I'm going to stand. I'm free to stand. He's free to sit. He's free to stand. I'm free to sit if I pray. Okay? Oh, but that's not patriotic. See, it ain't about God and country no more. It's about God and kingdom. And God and kingdom is different than God and country. You, you may have an allegiance to a country, but my allegiance, see, my citizenship is not of this world. The Bible says I have, this new covenant gave me new citizenship. I'm, I'm, I do have dual citizenship on earth, and I have citizenship in heaven. I use the things of earth because I'm still here. I need some of the things. I, I'm, not, I'm not against laws. I'm not against the rules that we have. I'm glad that's 55 miles per hour. I'm glad they finally raised this 70. You know? No, I don't. I used to, but I don't no more. But what, you know what happened when they raised it to 70, though, when they first raised it to 70? I saw how fast 70 was, and you could do it freely. Guess what I want to do? I want to go 75. Isn't it strange? No matter what the rule does, Every time you make a rule, someone wants to go beyond the rule, no matter what. It says 30 miles per hour. I get people all up on the back end of my car with this look on their face. It's, and I just do this. <laughs> I just do this. 30. That's why I'm doing 30. But see, no one wants you to be legal. But they don't want to lead the way. Okay? They want me to be illegal so I can get stopped. <laughs> so I point to the sign. So if you want to go faster than 30, go around me. All right? Because I'm not going to break that law. I don't like the money you have to spend when you break it. But here is Paul, of course, after the seventh chapter of Romans, where he Talks about, I think we did mention that, I did mention that, I, did, I know now. But again, 8 and 1, for there is, therefore now, no, everybody said no, condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus. See, condemnation can only come when I'm walking in the flesh. Matter of fact, the Bible said he condemned sin in the flesh. So when I started walking in condemnation, that means that I'm not walking after the spirit. Now I'm walking after the flesh. And, and if I walk after my flesh, I cannot but have condemnation. And matter of fact, that's the reason why we can tell whether we're in the spirit or not. It's not just a matter that I have condemnation. The only people that can condemn is people who have condemnation. That's why, that's why Christians, judgmental Christians, are walking in their own condemnation. We're like the elder son of the prodigal, you know, the elder brother. He never left home, he said. Did he say that? Never left home. So how did he know what his brother's doing? Well, he came back, but when he, when he came back, his brother didn't declare where he'd been. So how did, his, how did the elder brother know what his younger brother had done? He, he didn't. He never left the house. But he could only say what his, old, his younger brother done is because what he would have done in his own heart. How would he even know? But see, you don't, you don't, you don't even have to know what other people are doing. All you got to do is size up yourself. And when you see what you've done, the first thing you want to believe that everybody's going to do what you do. And most things that we come against people about, we're mad about because you know what really makes a Christian mad? It's somebody getting, getting by and getting away, and they ain't. <laughs> yeah, we get mad. 
because we think they're getting away with something and we're not. So we'll stay home and serve. I'm serving God. I'm serving God. Miserable all the time. I'm serving God. I'm serving God. Well, you're serving God, but you're not enjoying God. And so the first thing happens when you see other people that's not serving God like you're serving God, you know what they make you do? You make a judgment. Oh, yeah, they're going to bust hell wide open. Woo! But the only reason why you're upset, yeah, they're getting, getting away. Well, to you they are, though. Yeah, but, but to you, they're getting away. And you know what's really bad? I tell you what really make you mad. That you spent 40 years serving. One guy comes back. He's all messed up. And one day, he come in and get everything that you could have had. But you didn't want it because you're too busy serving. See, serving God, you got to understand a servant. God really ain't calling you to be a servant. He's calling you to be a son. You serve until you learn who you are because a good servant learns how to be a good son. But if you've never learned how to really serve right and all you've ever done is relegate yourself to be a servant and never a son, you don't understand the power that you have. You don't understand the joy that you should have. You don't understand the peace that you should have. Because you always run about, is my work good enough? How many people put a, a five-star mark on their work? Man, I know God like this. You know, I used to hear people brag about the program they put on. <laughs> Man, we, have, we put on a good program. I, I put on a good program. Well, okay, what, what was good about it? What, what was really good about it? We got a whole... Church world out here every day is trying to figure out, try to figure out how to have a new party, a new conference, a new something that supposed I did the last one they had. And yet, really, when you get to going through all them programs, annual programs, annual this and annual that, is that you got the same thing last year that well, that you got this year? Well, Nothing. Zero, all you done is wasted a whole lot of time. A whole lot of energy putting something to something that don't matter about anything. Unless what we're doing is making you more like Jesus, you, we might as well shut that thing down because it ain't helping nobody. Hello. How in the world can we get 5, 10, 20,000 people together not one person even get healed? Well, but our program is pretty. Come on, preacher. This our program is good. Man, did you hear how she sang? Did you, boy, did you see how he preached? Mm. It, did it do you any good? Did it do you any good? They sang good. Did you get saved? Did you get a better relationship with God because the song was good? I got a lot of good songs I love. But none of them songs ever changed me. I got preaching tapes. I got all kind of tapes. I got tapes from everywhere. You know, I listen to them. They're good. But they didn't change me. Because when I get through hearing the songs and I get through hearing them preach, I still got to hear him. And most of the time, we still haven't heard Jesus yet. We're still in the concept that Moses and the Israelites had. Don't talk to us, God. Give us a man that can speak to us. Moses, when God wants to talk to us, go get the word for us and bring it back to us. Let me tell you something, friend. That day is gone, been long gone. You need to wake up every day and realize God has an agenda. He has an agenda for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And if you just listen, you'll be amazed because it ain't going to, I know what you're looking for him to say. You know, <laughs> I, I know what you want him to say because that's where we're at. You know, we, we, we can hear God if he's saying something good. What we want to hear. Well, See, because we have become a God to our own self. Well, we, ate, we drank the Kool-Aid from the deceiver that says you're good at making yourself like God. Well, your little fig leaves done dried up. Well, All we've been doing is changing uniforms. 
And we have still not had the change God wants us to have. Because the new covenant was to bring about a whole brand new change. New birth was a brand new birth, one you never had before. So you cannot reach back in the old and try to figure out, you know what, when Adam was born or created, he had no idea how he was born. Uh, let me say it again then. When Adam woke up, he didn't even know how he got there. You think he woke up saying, oh man, I see, I felt your hands when you put my fingers together. Huh? Huh? He had no concept. You know why? That's the first time he had been there. And since it was the first time he had ever been there, guess what? He had discovered what was there when he got there. Hello? Our new birth should have been the same way. We never been there before. Even when the Lord told them um, when they're going into the promised land, they're going over into the promised land, he said, you have never walked this way heretofore. Never. Are we walking in places we've never been? Oh, are we still trying to repay our same old pathway? And that's usually what we've done. We've recycled our path. You know, we just like out here, you know, after so long, them cars rolling down the street, eventually potholes, you know, we don't want to change our direction. We just want to keep going down the same street. So what we need to do, we need to fix up our way. We didn't repave our way. You know, you know, like they say even the Bible said, you know, one of the things that got them all messed up, Paul even talked about, you know, about the tradition of his fathers. The one of the things they couldn't get away from was the tradition of their fathers. They put more stock in the tradition of their fathers. I don't know how many people I've heard. We, I had one guy say the post-apostolic fathers. I don't know who they are. I really don't care who they are. Because the Bible say we have not many fathers. And you only have one. And Jesus even made it mention one time, and when you have seen me, hallelujah, you've seen the father. But you know what? As long as you're looking to flesh to see who your daddy is, you're not going to see the father. We are, we're looking to others. We're looking to tradition. We're looking to this. And none of those things has worked. And now I'm going to tell you right now, don't try to tell me something's working if it ain't working for you. Come on now. Come on. Come on. Don't tell me to have faith that you ain't got none. <laughs> huh? Don't try to explain to me about this if you ain't never been there. That's right. And that's too much. We have too much free advice that is not advice because you can't really convince and be convincing or convicting if you've never, ever lived that. This book is filled. You know, even, even when we were just talking about troubles a while ago, you read the last chapter of, 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 Reb, I mean, of Hebrews, 11 chapter in the end of that, and it talks about people who had faith. Some of them was sawed asunder. Some of them was, was going to eat, off, they was offered relief, and they refused it. They was offered, come from under it, but they refused it because they knew there was something better. We have not came to the revelation of there is really something better because we're still trying to rework that which doesn't work. Paul says that for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law, huh? Yes, it could not do. And we're still saying it can. It can. In the sending his own son in the likeness of say what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. But what it couldn't do, God could. Not only could God, but God did. He came in the likeness 
of sinful flesh. And no matter what the devil done, he came in a likeness of sinful flesh, but nothing in him was sinful. We don't have that testimony until we get him. We only have that in him. That's right. But what the law couldn't do, because there was no law that you could keep that would ever make you right enough for God. If I kept all 613 laws, I would still be just as evil. You know why? Because the law is good and the law is spiritual. But I'm sold under carnality. How was I sold under carnality? You remember when Adam... Made that decision that morning. Let his wife get him in trouble. Amen. Yeah, that's what they do. I, I'm sorry. I, but anyway, I, praise I, God, I, hallelujah, I, Jesus. I, I, but anyway, <laughs> he let his wife get him in trouble. I know a lot of them are supposed to be men too, but they still get it, let his wife get him in trouble. But anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I see I got one over here. I'm through, I'm through the brick. It doesn't hit somebody. <laughs> I, I, I knew somebody was going to holler. But anyway, the, the story is there for you. That's right. Amen. You know. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I, don't get me wrong. I'm, this is not a chauvinistic teaching. It's just the truth of the matter. And the reason being is that, number one, Men and women don't think alike. Okay? Women, women, I'm, yeah, I'm glad too because I don't want a woman thinking like me. I don't want my wife thinking like me because we be at each other all the time. Because ain't nothing like a woman thinking that she's a man. That's a fight. I don't blame you. I, I haven't said it. But here's the thing. Listen to this. See, the woman thinks with her heart. She is more emotional. She thinks with her heart. She does. Amen. And so she, she, she is subject to make a whole lot of emotional thing. They are very subject to feelings. Yeah, feelings. Honey, I feel this is right. I bet you she told Adam. Honey, I, I, I'm just, I feel like, you know, the devil may be right. We might need to eat some of this. And we'll be just like God. And so she went on and first one to jump. See, baby? <clears throat> See? Didn't do nothing. Didn't do a thing. See? It's okay. It's okay, baby. Uh, and then, and then, let me show you, let me show you the man part. Because sometimes he get overwhelmed with love. Now, love is sacrificial. Now, today we don't really have that type of love too much like they Adam and Eve had. Because I'm not going to lie to you. If my wife eats the forbidden fruit today, she on, she's the only one going to be dead. <laughs> yes. Well, the Bible says this. You're right. He willingly partook. Okay? He, he willingly partook. Because, number one, it wouldn't even make sense if he didn't because he ain't got another wife. He ain't got no choice but to die if she die. Otherwise, he's going to be monking around. <laughs> huh? So, the Bible said the woman was to see, you, you know, and, and it really works even today. Now, check this out. Now, now when people want to sell y'all something, who they come to? 
us because we like stuff. No, you know why? You know why they always talk to the woman, don't want to talk to the man? Because the devil knows. If I can move her emotionally, I can get her to help him make a decision that he don't even want to make. How many times have you went and sat down and the guy, see, he come to my house trying to sell me them Kirby vacuum cleaners. I'm sitting over here. He, he ain't even looking at me. That is a woman's he said, and money, money. He, 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 I, look, check, check me out. He ain't talking to me. Ma'am, just got this. And ma'am, then look over at me. He said, don't you think it'd be good for your wife? No. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. So even, even just naturally speaking, everybody knows. If you're going to sell something, you can sell it to a woman quicker than you can a man. Now, this is not always the case in everything because we're all different. Okay? But, I need, but you need to understand one thing. As, as this woman partook of the forbidden fruit, because she was deceived. Amen. We all, we all know the story. But I, I okay, you. put your hand up then. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, now you were down for the woman. I didn't buy this right. I'm not trying to discourage you. Okay. Now you say we think with our heart, we're emotion, that's factual. But now tell me what did the man think with it? His mind? <laughs> with his. No, you're on tape, so I won't answer. No, 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 no. I, no, I don't have no problem with that. I don't have no problem with that because man is more analytical and he thinks more with his mind than he does with his heart. Matter of fact, oh no, I, I, no. A mama is more concerned about her kids. We're supposed to be. Uh, you know what dad's concerned about? Making a living. All right? So, so we are geared, we are geared to be a provider and a protector. Okay, that's, but what I'm saying, this is how we're geared. A woman is not geared for that. She is geared more for learning how to be a mother and a wife and all these different things. She's all caught up. Matter of fact, the Bible even tells you that, you know, the woman has a, a love for the world. She has a love for things. She wants stuff. She like things. But a man doesn't think like, say, a man, you see, you, you know, my wife will say, Honey, that sure is a pretty picture. I don't need no picture. I got a newspaper. <laughs> but you know, even with a wife being there, a wife, like you said, I look back at the virtuous wife, a virtuous woman. What we do, we make it to be a family thing for our husband because we love him. We want him to come home to a clean house, a beautiful home, meals on the table. I know, emotion. Emotion. A man, you know, a man, uh, uh, like you, you would go through, all, you go through all that and put new bread spreads on the bed. You know what he does when he come in? Do you think he's looking at the bed spread? No, he's putting the bed spread back and jumping in. He could care whether you put a new rug in the living room. He could care, uh, he could care less about that. He could go on. Okay, what well, I'm, the reason I'm trying to tell you now is that we don't even think like women. The things that y'all call pretty, you know, we'll smile. Hey, yeah, yeah, but it ain't mean nothing to no, but see, that's what I'm saying, though, because we think different. You know what I'm saying? I'm not taking nothing away from the man. I'm not taking nothing away from the woman. This is just the way we're geared. And so you need to understand that. This is how we are geared. Agree. You I, know? I'm with you on it, but that's what you married a woman for. Like you said, we are for the... Like no, the no let, let's go... Let, 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 let's just keep it in the book, though. He created the woman. The, the woman, the man, was, the man was not born from a woman. But the woman was taken from, man. from man. man. And the reason why she's emotional is because she was taken from man's side. And this is the seat. This whole seat here is what they call the, our vital areas, the emotional area. So that's why she is like she is. But it takes two. That's why the two have to become one. And see, that's the hard part is because what happened in the fall is that a woman desire to rebel. Well, the Bible says, you know what? One of, one of the curses would be is that, you, woman, you're going to 
you're going, your, your husband desires is going to become your desires. You know what we try to mess up? We try to change that. We try to make the man, our desires become the man's desire. And see, every woman, believe it or not, underneath fights against that. No, don't say nothing. That's okay. I want you to think about that. Because when you think you are right, and when you think you got it together, so you're going slamming doors. You're going and saying, things, well, don't even touch me. <laughs> yeah, but see, that's not what the Bible says you would do. Okay, so I, well, what, I'm, what I'm showing you is that we're talking about two different makeups here. You know, so, no, I'm not trying to belittle a woman because the Bible says she may be weak, but she's not the weakest. I mean, even the weakest thing is this world can confound the strongest. Amen. Woman has been known to cause a war, Amen. cause a thousand ships to sail, to go to war. Amen. Helen of Troy. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. He gave them both. Both man and woman. Yeah, they both had it. Okay. okay. So why not him refuse to partake of what he knew was already wrong? Because God had already gave him. I show you the power of woman, though. <laughs> <laughs> It take, it take, but no, let, let, I'm, I'm going to go and clear it up for you because I don't want you to leave here thinking that. But here, but even though all that's good, but there was a reason why that story was. And it wasn't, it was more about prophecy than it was about the actuality, what was going on. Okay, because in the end, God is going to tear down that middle wall anyway. He's going to gather all things into himself. He's going to get a kingdom where it's not going to be neither male nor female. Now, what he's, he's not saying he's going to change our gender, but what he's saying is that I'm once again going to give dominion to both man and woman again, okay? But that whole thing was about, see, him being the, the uh, first man or the first Adam, there is a shadow of the second Adam, all right? Now, see, Jesus was not deceived. No man takes my life, but I'm going to lay it down. I'm laying it down. So really, Adam was really saying the same thing, Christ. Nobody's really taking my life because I got a right right now to keep living. I can live without you. Uh -oh. but, but because I love you, I'm going to lay down my life for you. Okay, so what Jesus done, same thing that Adam done. He came and ate the forbidden fruit so that he could free us to be free again. Okay, so he came in the likeness of sin of the flesh, took on, bore all our sins, bore them all, I mean all of them, from, from birth to death. He bore all of those sins so that now you could have a rebirth again. That's the reason why in, in the, in, 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 when he came, the Bible talks about he got pierced in his side. Amen. Guess what came out? Blood and water. Amen. You know why? He didn't want to lose a rib this time. Amen. Adam lost the rib. And I call it the splitting of Adam. And anytime you know anything about the splitting of Adam, you know that that become a combustible, explosive thing. <laughs> huh? But Jesus was not going to be divided. Amen. So he didn't split. They pierced him. Blood and water came out. That's why I said the spirit don't have flesh and bones. Amen. 
Because the new man God is trying to make does not consist of flesh and bone. Amen. It is. Because ah, the first time he split, it was a split. They were trying their best to become bone of bone and flesh of flesh. And there was always a big chasm of who's going to dominate. Who's going to be in charge? Who's head honcho? Still today, because you know why? We're still trying to function in an old kingdom instead of functioning in the new kingdom. All right? So, man, I said all that to say what? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I say that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but what? But after the spirit. Now, how do you know if you're walking after the flesh? Have you ever thought about it? How do you know you're walking after the flesh? Can, can you know you're walking after the flesh? Amen. You know how you know? Because you do mind the things of the flesh. The more you mind the things of the flesh, because the only thing can trouble us in our life, it's what happened to us in the flesh. Amen. So if I'm being, if I'm walking out the flesh and I'm going to be mindful of those things, of the flesh. But as long as I'm walking out the spirit, because in my spirit, there's always peace. There's always joy. There's always, always. Now, all I got to do is step back and get over in my flesh and everything against my flesh will bother me. Jesus walked in the spirit. Everything that you're going through, he walked through. Still unabated. There was just as much things happening around him as it is. You got people, they were saying all kinds of things about him, doing all kinds of stuff, trying to do all things to him, but he never got in the flesh. He walked in the spirit. All right? And see, when we start to become more mindful of our flesh, then that means you know where we're living. It don't take you long to figure it out. Amen. So if, if everything about me disturbing my flesh, bothering my flesh, then I know then God is trying to let me know I need to get out of that. Amen. I can change location without even moving. Well. All I got to do is live in a new dimension and then I ain't got to live in the old one. Because as long as I'm living in the old dimension, everything in the old dimension is going to always keep working. There's a law, Paul said, in my memories, warned. Every day I wake up, there's the laws in my memories that are warned. There's laws warned against the spirit. Then the spirit is done declared war against my flesh. And I, I will hope to say that the spirit is winning. Sometimes I have to ask myself, which one's winning today? But the old Indian said, I have two dogs that lives in me. I got a good dog and a bad dog, and they fight every day. You know, he said, the guy said, well, which one wins? He said, which one I feed the most? Amen. Which one do you feed the most? That's one that's winning. However you want to look at it, if I feed my flesh more, Guess who's going to be in control? Flesh is going to be in control. If I feed my spirit more, how do I feed my spirit? Though? See, I, I, know, I know how to feed my flesh. I know what to do to feed it. I mean, I'm surrounded with a smoker's board. <laughs> a buffet of all kinds of delicacies. I can get up any day and feed my flesh. But you know what? Feed my spirit is a little bit different. It's more than just getting up reading the Bible, though. It's got to be more than that. Amen. It's got to be more than just putting on a little gospel music. Amen. Got to be more than that. I got to be quiet, sit still, know that he is God, and I need to hear his voice because if I don't hear his voice, I can't. The only way God's going to feed me, he's got to feed me through my spirit. Amen. He's not going to 
Give some external things to feed me. That's why the Bible talked about the secret man of God. There's a secret man of God in which he feeds his people. My sheep knows my voice. Amen. And a stranger they will not follow. Amen. But see, we got a stranger living in us that almost sound like God most of the time. As a matter of fact, when he speaks, we almost rebuke him. No, you ain't asked me to do that. <laughs> I know you ain't asked me to do that. You know why we will say things like that to God? It's because what he's trying to tell us does not fit what my flesh says. It does not make my flesh feel comfortable. I don't feel comfortable taking a low road. It's hard to know how right you are and then have to humble yourself to someone who is not. Isn't that hard? Amen. Yeah. So the whole key to this thing is, number one, if I live after the flesh, I'm going to always mind the things. Yeah. But if I walk after the spirit, then I'm going to mind the things of God. I, I'm more in tune. I'm more susceptible. I want to see the manifestation of God. And when I say the manifestation of God, it's, I'm not talking about making him appear, but I'm talking about what comes out of me will always represent him. Because I cannot love my neighbor as I love myself without that emanating, getting in me first. There is a love that we must understand how much. I think Brother Thornton, you know, he's been on that for a while. And I think he's got the revelation, not just him. I just heard another guy down in someplace, South Carolina, saying the same thing, man. People of God don't even know how much they're loved. And we only, we only try to love people as much as we think we've been loved. That's the problem. Because if you don't think God treated you right, guess what you're going to do? How are you going to treat anybody else better than you think God done treated you? Impossible. But once you realize how much he loved you, then it's very easy for you then to give. Because God ain't asking you to, for your love. He is not asking you to give anything he hasn't already given you. So he's not asking you to go into the kitchen and cook up a pot of love and feed everybody. He's not asking you to do that. All he's asking you to do, first of all, let me love you. That's a whole journey in itself. Just sitting back, praying every day, God, show me how much you love me. Make Calvary real. Make what he done for you real. Pray every day, Lord, show me your love. And sometimes when he show you his love, it's, it almost scares you. He loves me so much. He loves me so much, he'll even let me go through a trial. That's love. Hmm? Is that love? He loved Job, didn't he? He loved him so much. Killed his kids. Burned the house down. Killed his cattle. Gave him a crazy wife. Oh, there we go again, ain't it? And women always show up, don't they? <laughs> Here's a man. Well, I'm just saying, though. It, it, what I'm saying, emotional. Watch this woman. She sees a man going through some stuff. Ain't nothing like, you know, you can catch, you, you can deal with devils everywhere but at home. And ain't nothing like, You'll help me. <laughs> Telling you, you know what you ought to do? You ought to just go and curse God and die with your pitiful self. That's what you're saying. And, and then he said, oh, foolish smelling. She wanted him God. He wanted him to quit. See, because the only way you can really curse God is to quit. 
If you quit, you've cursed it. A lot of times we always concerned about our language. You know, the most cursing you can do is telling God I can't. That's when you're cursing God now. You saying some bad words. I know we got a whole bunch of little dictionary on vulgarity, we call it. But that's, you know, strange. Some of those vulgar words is in the Bible. We can't even use them because we're too holy. Huh? No, we can't. If I got up this morning and preached some of them words in this Bible right here, some of you, ooh. He said, did you hear what he said? No. I don't care, but we have to, we have to, we are, our minds are so pure that we have to dance around some of them words. We do. You want me to give you one of them? No, you tell me one. Well, they, well, one of them, one of them, one of the words in there is called bastard. Okay, but then there's there's no one in there where it says in every man that pisses against. Yeah. You don't use that word, though, do you? I said you don't use that word, though, do you? I, I'm just saying, though. But I'm saying, though. But that would never come to you. We we have we keyed them words down a little bit. We did. I'm not going to say I'm going to the bathroom and take a piss. Okay. Why? I'm going to use the Why? Because that's not, that's not acceptable in today's society. See what I'm saying? That's right. No, you ain't going to. I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't get up and say that. You know why I wasn't going to say that? Because, number one, I know that our concept of our definition of these words has been determined, that this is a word that we don't use. We, we can think it. We can read it and think it. We can get it in our mind. That's even why when you hear a bad word, you say they curse. You know what, what was bad? It wasn't a word. The mind was already bad. Well, that's what I'm just saying. Like I just said, you don't, we quote scriptures. We quote a lot of things from the Bible, but there's a lot of things that we won't use because someone told us the language was bad. And then we'll turn around and curse, do our Pentecostal cursing, and don't even know it. What's that Pentecostal cursing? What's that? Murmuring and complaining. That's cussing all day long. You want to cuss God out, just start a murmuring and complaining. That's, that's cursing to God. That other stuff you're talking about don't mean a thing, but this does. The reason why they died in the wilderness is because they got the cursing. And how were they cursing? Murmuring and complaining. One thing, God, because one of the things when you murmur and complain, you're telling God he don't know what he's doing. When you murmur and complain, you're telling God he, he ain't really capable of doing what he needs to do. You're cursing God by not believing God. That's the biggest curse you could ever have. If, if I believe all things, everybody say this, all things work together. For the good, to them that what? That love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, when, if I believe that, then what am I complaining about? No, 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 no. Does that situation come under all things? Huh? So do I believe that all things are working together for the good? Oh, I don't. Because if the all things come and I'm still complaining and murmuring, then I ain't believe what I just said. Can I? I just told you all things. Didn't say I'm going to like them. Didn't say they're going to be good things. But it said all things, they work together. It's like sodium and chloride. That's how we get salt. But you eat one by itself, it'll kill you. <laughs> it will kill you. 
quick. But now, when you mix it together, you can put them on ham hocks and greens. But if not, it'll kill you. You, you know what happens? If you get one-sided, and all you think about is one part of the equation, and don't make all things come together, it'll kill you. More people die because they don't believe that all things, they work together, the good and the bad. Right. They work together. You see, if I give you too much sugar, you're going to get sugar diabetes and rotten tea. But if I give you some sugar and other stuff together, mixed together, you know, how many of y'all like sweets? I figured that. Now, how many of y'all go home and get a cup of sugar every day? <laughs> huh? You like sweets. But you don't like sweets like that. No. But it is sweet. But when does sugar taste best? When you put it in some other stuff. Woo, you don't even see the sugar. But boy, show us sweet to the taste. God bless you today. We'll be back. Is there any question before I quit?